Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. Love to hear the chatter, the fellowship. Uh, it always is good to be in the house of the Lord. If you're joining us through Facebook Live, we want to welcome you this morning. Thank you for uh, being with us. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, to come and just to worship, to hear the word of the Lord, and to be able to start the week off right. If you see Miss Vicki Glenn, please wish Vicki a happy birthday. Today is her birthday, so uh, reach out to her. Tell her you're thinking about her, and I know that she would appreciate that. Have a card of thank you. It says, Dear Waxhaw Baptist Church family and friends, we want to thank you for your prayers for us in the recent passing of our beloved daughter-in-law, Tammy. We're very much appreciative of all the lovely card, social media posts, and other expressions of sympathy. It is at times like this that we need our brothers and sisters in Christ to help carry the load of our sorrow, and you have done that well. Thank you, loving Christ, George and Marge, and we continue to lift you all up too in this time of uh, difficulty and know that we love you all and we continue to be here for you. If you would, just continue to remember the leadership of the church as we move forward, as we uh, look to see what our next steps are in the coming months. Uh, you may have seen that the governor put us in 2.5, phase 2, 2.5, whatever it may have been. Uh, but uh, we are looking uh, at the options of opening up Wednesday night again in the coming weeks. Uh, we need to get that approved through the leadership and things like that. But uh, we are slowly getting that way. So we just treasure your prayers for strength, for courage, uh, for knowledge and wisdom in that. So uh, just look out, be on the lookout in the coming days uh, about that. I have two passages of scripture I want to start off with this morning. Uh, the first is out of Jeremiah 1. 4 and 5 and it says now the word of the Lord came to me saying before I formed you in the womb I knew you and before you were born I consecrated you and then Psalm 139 13 through 24 says for you formed my inward parts and you wove me in my mother's womb and I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, and how vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sands. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed. For they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred, and they have become my enemies. Search me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. That should be our prayer today, is that the Lord would search us. Search our hearts to see what we are prepared to give him. Not in what he gives us, but what we are uh, prepared to give him during this next few minutes of the service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before your throne this morning just thanking you for another day of life, thanking you for the many blessings that you have given us just for the wonderful morning, the Christmas of the air, Lord, just to be able to know and acknowledge that there's a God who is there and who cares. He's a personal God. So, Father, I just pray this day that you would just search our hearts, 
that our hearts would be prepared to come before you through song, that it would, they would come before you in the message and then in the response time. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you worked in the first service uh, of where the Holy Spirit showed up. And Lord, there was healing that took place. I just pray, Lord, that you would just continue to uh, lead and guide us. Give us the knowledge and the wisdom to proceed in the coming days. I pray, Father, that you would just allow us to be the salt and the light that you want us to be. And Father, as we come together here in a minute, just to lift our voices as one, may you be praised and glorified because you're worthy of it. So, Father, we just turn this time over to you. We just ask, Lord, that you would uh, just bless us, uh, that you would just continue to allow us to focus on you. And for that, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory that you so richly deserve. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you would all stand with me, join with me, sing Because He Lives. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to and forgive he lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone Because he lives And then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's fight Oh, with pain And 
lightning as death gives way to victory. I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know He lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives Amen. Thank you. It's always that last verse that gets me. You know what? One day we're going to fight that final war. One day he's going to come back and he's either going to rapture us or we're going to die and we're going to take our last breath here and we will be with him forever. But until that point in time, we have a duty and an obligation as the soldiers of the cross to continue to be salt and light, to continue to uh, move his kingdom forward as he has charged us to do. That war will last until we take our last breath or until he raptures us home. As I was sitting in prayer time this past Tuesday, the Holy Spirit impressed this thought in my mind. If the enemy can do away with the conduct code of God, the moral laws, then the enemy can do away with God in society. And I think that we see that attack even today. We see it so, so prevalent in the social media. We see it so prevalent in, on the news. We see it so prevalent wherever we may be that people are trying to do away with the standard of truth in which we call the moral laws or the code of God. You see, they will never be done away with because that's who God is. Those laws are his very nature, his very character. But yet so many want to do away with them all we have to do is look over the past several decades the erosion which has occurred in our society the swing which has taken place according to the thoughts and minds of the nations of the world you know it started over in europe doing away with the standards and now it's trickled over into these united states it gets more prevalent each day However, as Christians, we shouldn't be caught up in that type of erosion. We shouldn't be caught up in, in all of that. We should understand the moral issues according to God's way of thinking, folks. It's not the way that I think. It's not the way that you think. It's not the way your friend thinks. It's not the way your boss thinks. It's not the way someone else thinks. But it's the way God thinks. We should think deeply on how issues affect the society and the culture we live in. You see, we don't do that. We don't love the Lord our God with all of our mind like we should be doing. If we believe in the moral lawgiver, then we must submit our thinking to his way. Yes, it's a lifelong process. But his way is right not ours we must educate ourselves on his word and we stand upon it unapologetically 
You know what? I stand upon the word of God unapologetically. I will never apologize for standing on the word of God here at Waxhaw Baptist Church, outside in the community, or wherever it is. I will never compromise that word. But even standing upon it, when we're outside and we're talking to other folks, we need to do it winsomely and informatively. There are many hot topics we're going to discuss over these next few weeks. Topics which many should investigate on your own. Let me challenge you to investigate these topics on your own. Not what the news says. Not what your friends say on social media. Not what the paper or anything else says. Let me challenge you to investigate them in God's word. Because that's where the truth comes from. Topics which must be decided in the heart from a study of the Lord's word on the subject. From the heart. Does God's word matter enough to you to get down in it and dive in it? To see what he says about it? Not what science says about it. Not what liberals say about it. Not what conservatives say about it. But one perspective. The Christian must seek out. And it's this one. What does God say about them? Too many Christians don't investigate these moral issues to be able to tell others why these issues are wrong. Many say, well, I'm on this side of the aisle. I line up with this group. Others say, my, my pastor told me this, or my Sunday school teacher told me this, or a nationally known Christian speaker said this. Yet when they're pushed further by someone who has a question about these issues we're going to talk about, an answer can't be given. It can only go so far. Why? Because we don't know what we believe and why we believe it. We are always relying on someone else to do our thinking for us. This morning we're going to... To start to look at hot topics of this conduct code. Over the last three weeks we've been laying the foundations of where the truth is. We've talked about the moral laws. We've talked about the ten codes, the commandments, the guidelines in which God has given us. And we laid that foundation of truth. Today we're going to discuss the abortion issue. That hot topic is going to be the abortion issue. You know what? We're coming into a time of election. And it's our duty as free Americans to go and vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. That's up to you. That's what you have to dive in and see. What I'm going to talk to you about today is God's view on it. If you have a problem with it, you're going to have to talk with him. Okay? Don't blame me. Don't say, hey, Chris, you know what? I don't, I don't care. Go, go to God's word. It's not my opinion. It's not my feelings or anything. It's God's word on the issue. To be able to go and to cast that vote, you need to be able to determine what you believe in being able to talk about these moral issues. You have to have them worked out in your hearts so you know exactly the reason why you vote the way that you vote. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be in the hot topics of abortion, of euthanasia, and of capital punishment. But this morning, we're going to talk about abortion. And we've talked about it many different times. But this morning we're going to see what the pro-choice people believe. We're going to see what the pro-life people believe. And then we're going to see what Christians must believe. Okay? Must believe about the abortion issue. And then lastly we're going to talk about the consequences, the forgiveness and the grace which can bring peace in the heart of those who may have made a wrong choice 
to have an abortion. You know why? Maybe you've talked to people that's had abortions. One of the biggest things that you have to put in the forefront of when you talk to people is not to be judgmental. You need to, you need to be able to sit down and talk to them and tell them about the love and the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus Christ shows them. And that they can be forgiven of that guilt. We're in the sixth commandment, basically. The moral law, you shall not kill. What does that mean? You shall not kill or you shall not murder. What, what's the meaning of that? That means the, the taking of an innocent life. You see, the first murder in the Bible was Cain and Abel. The last murder that has taken place took place about two or three seconds ago. I want you to think about that. Somewhere in this world. There's murder all around us. It's always happening. No matter where you're at. No matter what part of the world. There's always a murder taking place. The taking of innocent lives. God gave this. To man because man was made in God's image. You know, he says, you will not take an innocent life because they are made in my image. For no other reason, don't take it. The definition of that murder or that killing is the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. The crime of an unlawfully killing a person, especially in the malice of forethought, to slaughter... Is the definition of that. To not murder is a universal law in the world. Every culture in which there is known to man understands the universal law that murder is wrong. That you, won't, you shouldn't kill people. You shouldn't kill innocent people. And it's wrong and there's punishment in every sense except one and that's abortion you see in every other sense if somebody takes a innocent life it's premeditated murder that life is forfeited it may be a few years down the way but it's forfeited it's a death penalty except in the sense of abortion the murder of babies there's no punishment for. Not at least in this country. Maybe when God comes back and he judges the ones for that. But there's no punishment. The culture has made people immune to it until it touches them. You see, people don't really care about it. They don't really talk about it. They don't really have anything to say or, or want to tell people what they believe and why they believe it because it doesn't affect them until it does. But you know what? We should be more sensitive to the issue. We should be foregoing out in the forefront of the issue. We should talk to people. I can tell you when I was in the marketplace, I had a talk about abortion at least twice a month with people. Wanting to know what I thought on it and what I believed and how I believed you see, in the culture we live in today, life has no value. You can see it. You can turn on the television and see it every day. You have gangs on the street to the executive offices in Manhattan to the Capitol building on the hill. Life has no value. Life has no value, especially in the womb. Since 1972, the life which is created in the room goes unprotected because of men's wicked hearts and laws. See, it was man that opposed God's moral law, his code of conduct. Man decided, yes, we need to do this. We need to give this as a choice. Let's make a law. Well, what does that law do? It reflects man's own wicked heart. All the while, the false teachings of a blob of tissue, the baby feels nothing. They're not a person until they're 
outside the womb they have no rights continues to infiltrate a postmodern society who makes up their own truths about the issues i've i've hit on this since i've been here about this postmodernism this postmodern belief of of you know what there's no truth there's no absolute truth you just make your own truth up and it's more prevalent today than it was when i was growing up Because when I was growing up, God's law was what people followed. So let's look at this hot topic a moment. Let us see what the Christian's conduct code must be for this topic. Has to be. So let's look at the first truth, the pro-choice side. The pro-choice side. Roe versus Wade, 1972-1973, it changed the landscape of abortion as we knew it. We're still feeling the effects today as there's thousands performed each year. In 1992, the Supreme Court decided Planned Parenthood versus Casey. By a 5-4 vote, the court basically reaffirmed the abortion rights it granted to women in its 1973 verdict of Roe versus Wade, in refusing to overturn Roe, here's what the court reasoned. Listen to this reasoning. Some of us as individuals find abortion offensive. Yeah, no duh. You're taking a life, an innocent life. To our most basic principles of morality. Well, yeah, because that's why you have a conscience and the universal laws are written on your heart. But that cannot control our decision. What? It can't control our decisions. Now listen, our obligation is to define liberty of all. Well, you're, you're trying to define liberty of all, but how about the one in the womb? You're not defining any liberty for them. Of all not to mandate our own moral code. Hey, you know what? We're not going to decipher that this is true. We're going to leave it up to you, postmodernism. True for you, not for me. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of universe, and the mystery of life. That's our Supreme Court in 1992's reasoning. Who's going to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, and universe, and mystery of life for the one that's in the womb? They have no voice. Except for us. We've seen Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. Birth control advocate, nurse, sex educator. She was the one that opened the first... Planned Parenthood Clinic, she was known as a racist in her stance on abortion. All you got to do is read her biography. Of course, we know Planned Parenthood has been in the news quite often selling the baby parts for profit but denying it. We've seen it. It's all over. You can look and see and you can research that. So what are some of their arguments for abortion. What are some of the pro-choice arguments? Well, one of the first ones that they like to put out is that many want to use the rape argument for abortion. The rape argument. Do you know that less than 1% of rape and incest case actually conceive? It's such a horrific crime. Nothing on the part of the victim is to be blamed about. But it's a horrific crime. Although it's gross and awful crime, the one who did the act is the one who should be punished. The baby is an innocent product of those crimes. People say, hey, you know what? If you make that lady carry full term, there's, there's going to be all that emotion and, and reliving all of that. But statistics show and surveys show that when they get an abortion, that the emotional 
stuff that they carry are worse than if they would carry it and gave it up for adoption. There's always other avenues. That innocent life wasn't the cause. Secondly, some use the excuse of furthering their careers. I've heard this one. I can't do that with an unwanted pregnancy. I got, I got to move up the ladder. I got to be successful, powerful. You know what? I got to keep up with my husband or I got to keep up with whoever. I don't have the time like that. I want to advance. Well, you know what? There's many women's careers that ended every day by abortion. They never had a chance for a career. Thirdly, the unborn baby is part of her body. This is one of the main arguments in which people don't know how to answer. It's not true. The baby is not part of the woman's body. The baby is not part of the body. The womb is a place for development. That's where the placenta is feeding the baby. But it's not a part of the mother's body. Why? Because if it was a part of the mother's body, there would be no boys born. They would all be girls. When the sperm and the ovum come together, it creates a new creature called what? A zygote. It's a new life, not a blob of tissue. The baby has 23 chromosomes from the mother and 23 from the father. At the time of conception, the hair color, the eye color, the bone structure, the skin color has already been determined. By the time that the woman has figured out that she was pregnant, the heart has formed and it's beating. It's not a part of her body. It's a bad argument. Fifth, it purifies the gene pool of any defects. That's a poor argument too. That's a selfish argument. That's an argument that doesn't even need to be brought out of one's heart or one's mouth. We don't do this to people who are deformed now or have birth defects now, do we? Why would we do it then in the womb? Only out of selfishness does that argument come from. God doesn't make mistakes, folks. God does not make mistakes in the womb. He's perfect no matter how they come out. Sixth, it'll present the deaths of many women when going for backstreet abortion studies were done before the abortion law ever took effect. Before the law, there was about 45 deaths total due to abortions. You never hear that, do you? And mostly because they didn't have antibiotics. Most of the deaths were from not having antibiotics. Judge Robert Bork stated, convenience is becoming the theme of our own culture. I can tell you from what studies show that 93% of abortions are elective. It's sad. Seven, it saves the mother's lives. Extremely rare. It's the exception, not the rule. It's a very rare thing that happens when the mother and the child is both involved and you have to make a decision. But I can tell you that that's the mother and the father's decision based upon what the doctors are telling them and them going to the Lord. It's the loss of one versus two lives. It's a hard decision. Hate to have to make it. But I can tell you that even whatever that decision is made, whichever life is going to be saved, it's not a morally wrong decision. Because one life was given for the other, whether that was the mom or the baby. It's not morally wrong. There shouldn't be any guilt in that. And a lot of times that situation takes care of itself many times.
So let's look at the pro-life. Let's look at the pro-life side. I don't know if uh, many of you watched any of the uh, national convention or not, but there was a lady on there named Abby Johnson. Abby Johnson was a former Planned Parenthood clinic director. She was given quotas and incentives. And at the Gulf Coast facility near Houston, Texas, they paid her up to $20 every time she convinced a woman who were planning an abortion to donate their baby's remains to research. It was profit sharing scheme. It's 10% of $200 the clinic received for each aborted baby that was enrolled in that research. 20 women a day could be processed. A person could earn $400 a day, usually work six days a week. You can do the math on that. Pretty lucrative. She said, we were instructed to tell women this was a life-saving research. Isn't that sad? Folks, this is what I'm saying is why we need to believe what we need and know what we believe so we can tell people about these false truths. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. It was a way to give back to the greater good. Call an evil good and good evil. It made, them not, it made them feel not as guilty since we were selling a product and not a human life. Ms. Johnson resigned her post in 2009 after seeing an ultrasound of the baby being aborted. See, see why it's so important when you talk to people about who was thinking about to get them into an ultrasound somewhere. Go look. Go see. You know what? Because if you don't see, you don't have to really think. She said this, sin blinds the heart. I couldn't see it until I saw it on the ultrasound. Wow. Wow. Now, she's a part of the pro-life movement. Not all people who are a part of the pro-life movement are Christians. But they understand the moral implications of abortion. The medical testimony says at a U.S. congregational hearing in 1981, experts all agreed about the beginning of the individual life. Now, this is history, folks, and a lot of people want to do away with history, so they don't want to hear this kind of stuff. But Michelle Matthews Rolfe, a doctor, said in biology and medicine, it's an accepted fact that the life of any individual organism reproducing by sexual reproduction begins at conception or fertilization and that means animals or human okay that's just a scientific fact that they've known for many many years dr jaime gordon says now we can say unequivocally that the question of life begins is no longer a question for theological or ph uh, philosophical dispute it is an established scientific fact that all life including human life begins at conception you see, the science says it, but yet why do people ignore the science in which God has given us to tell us that there's no doubt in our minds that life begins at conception? We know when life starts because it's scientific evidence and it has been answered. As we talk to people, we need to tell folks, as we sit and we have these hard conversations, as we sit down across from somebody who may have had one, we need to give them the truth. Not just from the Bible. We'll get to that here in a minute. But from what science has shown and, and what has uh, been shown in that aspect of it. So what's the Christian's ethics on the topics? You know, as Christians, we don't follow our own moral code, right? We've, we've established that. The truth is set. We follow God's moral code. 
We follow and we obey the moral code that the creator of all life has given us as the universal law. For if we love him, we'll follow his commands. Isn't that what 1 John 5, 3 says? So what's the definition of that ethics and morals? It means to act in accord with accepted rules of conduct that cover moral as opposed to non-moral matters. We must come to a determination on what is right and wrong. Where do you gauge your right and wrong from? That, that, that's the question. Where do you gauge your right or wrong from? For Christians, that's determined in God's word. What he has set forth in his word, that's the standard. It's part of loving God with what? All of our mind. We talked last week about loving God with all of our mind. We can't love God with all of our mind if we don't know what his word says about some of these moral issues in which are being presented to us on a daily basis. If we love him enough, we will go to him and we will see the truths that he lay out and then we'll take some of this other evidence that's out there from the medical and we'll put it back in because we know that it's true and it's credible and then we make a testimony out of that to where we can talk to people reasonably and logically. But it's what God says. Not what I think, not what my choice is, not what my friends think because they're living in the world or whoever else. We're going to be in Psalm 139. Walk with me through Psalm 139, 13 through uh, 24 this morning. See, we're going to, we're going to talk about what God says about personhood. Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. Now, I want you to sit there and think about that just a minute. You formed me in my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. And... It takes me back to Genesis 1. It takes me back to Genesis 1 or 2 where God took the clay and he formed Adam and he formed Eve. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought, uh, fashioned in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed uh, substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not. One of them. Look, he wrought, he fashioned me. He fashioned you. David said, he fashioned me in my inward post. He wove me in my mother's womb. You know, my mom and grandma and a lot of other folks, they used to sit around and knit. That's what they used to do way before social media ever came in, 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 in place. And I would sit over there and I'd watch my mom. I remember I was probably six, seven, eight, nine years old. Mom would be over in the in the chair over there and she'd have this big ball of yarn and those knitting needles and she'd start knitting something together whether it was a blanket or whatever it was you see that's what i see when i read that you see god knitted us he he knew exactly before you were ever formed he knew exactly what he was going to knit you into or knit me into. He created. Through that natural process. Through his guiding sovereignty. And knitted us. And we're fearfully and wonderfully made. What does that mean? It means there's no one else like you. No one. You might think, say well thank God. But. You're unique. You, the Lord fashioned you into a unique individual for a distinct purpose in this life. Now, 
no matter what challenges you may face. You know, he goes on and he says, um, and skillfully wrought, fashioned in that depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. You know, God was the supernatural superintendent. He could see all your bones, all your arteries being formed. He was overseeing the whole process. He was protecting in the womb. He was giving David the shelter. The uninformed, or the unformed substance is that embryo, that, that fetus. In it. And he said, before I knew you, is what he told Jeremiah, right? Before I formed you. I knew you. I knew what you were going to look like. He can see all the way from when you were formed here, all the way to where you're going to die here. He knows everything about you, every intimate detail. You see why we need to protect the womb? Because there's a person there. And it started at conception. He knows exactly how the person who was conceived will be and he has a plan for them no matter how the world might see him. Ecclesiastes 11.5 says, Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant women, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. The Bible teaches us that it's a pre-born child in the womb. And it should be treated as a person. Luke 1, 41 through 44, Mary and Elizabeth. What? The child jumped for joy in her womb when they heard the voices. That, that uh, word baby, brephos in the Greek, means baby infant. It's the same word as they use as Jesus lying in the manger. Psalm 51, 5 says, conceived in sin, David said, I was conceived in sin, had a sinful nature. He claimed he was a distinct human being from conception, not part of his mother's body, but he was a distinct in personhood. I was conceived in what sin. Genesis 25, 22 through 23. Children in the womb. In the Hebrew, it's ben, B-E-N. It's used over 4,900 times of either a son or a child. Exodus 21, 22 through 25 says, God strives to honor and value life of the preborn. You know, he, he sets it. He, he says that they're a person. Just because an infant can't perform moral action doesn't negate it the fact that they're a person see David was praising his creator how precious also are your thoughts to me how vast is the sum of them he says in 17 if I should count them they would outnumber the sands when I awake I am still with you you know what I praise you Lord for that unborn baby in the womb Need to tell folks that. Need to tell folks who may be thinking about getting an abortion or whatever it is that God may bring into your path. Say, look, we, you need to praise the Lord for that. They're a person. The very least that could be said is that at the moment of conception, there exists a potential human being, or better, a human being with potential who is sacred and valuable to God as evidenced by God's personal involvement. You know what? As Christians, folks, as Christians, this is why we stand upon the truth of God's word, that we don't waver off of it, that abortion's wrong. It's morally wrong. What's it called? What's that? thing called in the womb it's called a fetus or a pre-born child an unborn child a baby it affirms that from the moment of conception or fertilization there exists a moral human person 
the fetus at conception, the infant at birth, a person. Dr. Carl F. Henry put it well. A Christian response to the abortion crisis encourages a new respect and sense of responsibility for the body and its use. A woman's body is not the domain and property of others. It is hers to control. And she alone is responsible to God and to society for its use. When she yields that control through pregnancy, is involved into an intrapersonal relationship with a second party, and through conception to a third party, and indeed to human society as a whole, it becomes too late for her to justify abortion on the basis of self-determination. See, it affects the whole society. There's more than just one person. It's not just her. It's the other person involved. And then it's society involved. The God of creation and redemption is also the guardian of the womb. However, much abortion on demand would contradict or scorn such a conviction. David goes on in that psalm. And he says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly. And your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. You see, my prayer is this. That, Lord, those who have wicked hearts, who wants to make wicked laws, I ask that you transform their hearts through your Son, Jesus Christ. You have told me that we should pray for our enemies. And that we should, we should give them a cold cup of water or food to drink, eat. And that's my prayer, Lord. That you would transform these folks into understanding what is taking place. And that through that, that they would change their hearts and their lives and their thoughts through the transformation of your Holy Spirit. That's my prayer about abortion. That's my prayer for Democrats and Republicans and independents and people who don't vote or whoever it is that support it. I pray that God would transform their lives. I pray that they would understand who the God of this universe is. John Peterson was going through a tough time of life when he wrote this song. No one understands like Jesus, his friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy, he's waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus every woe he sees and feels. Tenderly he whispers comfort and the broken heart he heals. No one understands like Jesus when foes of life assail. You should never be discouraged. Jesus cares and will not fail. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on the way. Through you, though you fail him, sadly fail him, he will pardon you today. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. Folks, once again, those folks who believe in this issue, who believe that abortion's right or who has had abortion at some time in their life or who has been involved in a, an abortion, who carry that guilt and that shame, who carry that ignorance and not understanding what it's all about. There is forgiveness at the cross. We need to understand that as Christians, as we talk to people about this, there is forgiveness for them at the cross. For Jesus Christ came and shed his precious blood for the sins of this world, not just for Christians, for the whole world. He gave them a choice to whether to follow him or not. He overcame death and proclaimed victory. That victory is yours today. If you've been a part of that abortion, you can come today. 
And you can ask for forgiveness. And He will forgive you of that. And He will continue to give you peace and comfort. And He will reassure you that you will be reunited with your child in heaven again. The guilt-ridden feelings will be washed away. And you can be assured that they are. The Bible teaches us Christians, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, maybe it's the way in which you talk to people about this very important issue. Maybe it's the way that you judge them. Maybe it's the way that you just can't fathom why they done that and there's bitterness and there's anger in your heart. We need to ask God to forgive us of that type of judgmental attitude because we're all sinners saved by grace. I don't know what God's got on your heart this morning. As Debbie and as Andrew come and we sing our hymn of invitation, the altar's open. The altar's open. Whatever you need to do, you can come and you can do it here at the altar. You can do it right where you're sitting. If you want to pray with me, I'll be glad to pray with you, whatever it is. I can tell you in the first service, the Holy Spirit moved this morning. He moved. I didn't know what to do. So I just stood back and let him. So don't be afraid. Come to the foot of Jesus. Whatever it is that's on your heart this morning. Would all stand with me? Oh uh -huh.